we want to know what did Paul have in mind? What did what was John thinking or Moses or David or all the other biblical authors? What did they have in mind? And we're really divided from them by this chasm of culture and time mm-hmm. and geography. There's a lot of, of difference between us and the original authors. So we need to carefully study what they wrote instead of just assuming right off the bat, oh, I know exactly what that means. Right. Um, we just really want to respect the authors and try to to understand what they meant by what they said. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am back with my friend, Naomi Vaccaro, and we're talking about quiet time. Um, I, I hope this has been encouraging to you because I know that so many people, January 1st comes and you're like, my New Year's resolution this year is gonna be to spend time with the Lord. And maybe that's every day, maybe that's just on a more regular basis, that's just establishing the habit of building a relationship with the Lord and spending time with Him. And so maybe some of you, it's going to the gym. Maybe that's your thing. But here's the thing. If your New Year's resolution is to go to the gym, you can walk on a treadmill or lift weights and listen to the Word of God at the same time. So it's like a win-win. You can do both things together. Um, Or maybe you're listening to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast while you're at the gym. People have told us that they've done that before. So that's always a fun thing to listen to. Um, Anyway, welcome back to the podcast. We're, We're gonna have a great conversation today. We're gonna talk about inductive Bible studies, what that is, what it looks like, and we're gonna walk through how to do an inductive Bible study and then how to teach our kids how to do an inductive Bible study. But before we get into our conversation, I want to say thank you again to our sponsor, BJU Press Homeschool. Um, You guys, if you're looking for great curriculum for basically any subject, any grade, BJU Press Homeschool has something for you and for your family, and they are solid. You can visit them at bjupresshomeschool.com. Um, You could talk to one of their consultants who can help walk you through what the best thing is for your family. They meet every learning style, teaching style. I mean, they're just amazing. So bjupresshomeschool.com, check them out. Um, Also, if this podcast has been a blessing to you and your family, would you consider supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked Ministry? There are a few ways, of course, that you can do that. Would you share this with your friends? That's huge. Um, That is how we help get the word out about the podcast is by you sharing it with your friends. So maybe send them a link to the YouTube video, send them a link to the podcast through whatever podcast app you're listening to it on. Uh, Just share it with your friends so that they can have the encouragement as well. Also um, subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that through our website as well, um, schoolhouserocked.com. And then also um, financial support. We are always in need of that uh, so that we can keep this ministry going. Thank you again to those of you who continue to support us financially. It is more of a blessing than you know. So uh, you can do that again at the website, schoolhouserocked.com. Click on the donate button. Um, We are so grateful for that. So thank you for being back with me, Naomi. Um, Let's talk about inductive Bible study. And I know some people are probably like, what is that word inductive? We've talked about quiet time, what that looks like, but define inductive Bible study. And let's talk a little bit about the importance of doing an inductive Bible study. Yes. So first I would just encourage the listener not to be overwhelmed by this. Um, If you are new to having a quiet time, just start by reading. That's really all that's needed. Just start reading and exposing yourself to God's word. Inductive Bible study is a a more in-depth examination of the text. Uh, And if you are interested in that, then go ahead and get started. But it's not absolutely necessary in order to connect with Christ during your quiet time. So here's what it is. Inductive Bible study is a method of studying the Bible that focuses on really carefully and systematically examining the text in order to accurately understand what it means. And it's called inductive because it relies on observation and analysis of the text itself rather than starting with preconceived ideas or interpretations that you're trying to put into the text. You're letting the text tell you what it has to say. So basically, when we approach scripture, we need to recognize that while this is, yes, it is the inspired divine word of God, it it was not written primarily to us or or directed directly to us, um, if that makes sense. It's written for us, but it wasn't necessarily written to us at the time of its writing. And so... That's huge, you guys. Once we realize that the Bible was written, the the books of the Bible, they were written by certain humans at certain times 
in certain places to certain people for certain purposes. And these factors really do change depending on what book of the Bible you're reading. So I, I like to say that inductive Bible study is a way of respecting the original author of the passage we're reading. Sometimes I think we forget that um, the Bible, yes, it is uh, God's word. Uh, he is the primary author, big A. But God, from the very start of creation, from, from the very beginning of this story, he wants to partner with humans. And he has partnered with and through humans to create scripture, to write these words. And so we want to know what did Paul have in mind? What did what was John thinking or Moses or David or all the other biblical authors? What did they have in mind when they used certain words or formulated certain thoughts uh, and were really divided from them by this chasm of culture and time mm -hmm. and geography? There's a lot of, of difference between us and the original authors. So we need to carefully study what they wrote instead of just assuming right off the bat, oh, I know exactly what that means. Right. Um, we just really want to respect the authors and try to to understand what they meant by what they said. Yeah. Um, when you and I talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, I said, I really want to walk through a specific passage and do an inductive Bible study because I didn't want to just talk about what it is. I actually want to walk through the process of doing this. So we're going to do a brief overview of what an inductive process looks like. Um, and so the passage that I chose, and this was hard. I think I started with one. I can't remember which one I said we should do. And then I I read 1 John 5, 1 through 5. I said, no, let's do this one instead. Yeah. And then as I was reading that and reading others, I was like, oh, maybe we should have done this one. Maybe we should. And, I, and so I, I stuck with 1 John 5, 1 through 5. And I'm going to read this passage really quickly. And then we're going to actually uh, walk through the inductive process of 1 John 5, 1 through 5, so that you can see what an inductive process looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we'll just go from there. So this is uh, 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Um, this is out of the ESV. And actually, I, I read it through the ESV, NASB, and NIV. And all of them were almost word for word the same. And I thought that was really interesting because there are some passages that are very different. Yep. But this particular passage was almost exactly the same in each version that I read. So this is the ESV version. And it says this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever, the, whoever has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So let's walk through kind of what the process is. As it, you know, we're going to sit down, do an inductive Bible study of 1 John 5, 1 through 5. What would be the first step that we would take? Yes. So first, I always recommend prayer. Just ask the Lord for wisdom. Ask Him for help. Uh, we want to approach Scripture with humble, open hearts whenever we open God's word. So ask for the Holy Spirit to help you. And then the first step after that is observation. We want to look at this text and pay close attention to repeated words, certain phrases, the structure of the passage. We're looking for details. We're looking for key terms, literary devices. We're, we're just trying to see what's there. Um, and then we're, we're going to try to see what is the context of what is there, which that's kind of part of the observation, but it, it can be another step in and of itself. So as I'm looking through 1 John 5, 1 through 5, I'm, I'm highlighting words that I'm, I'm seeing used a lot, you know, like the word love, that, that seems to be a big one here. Um, a couple of repeated phrases like born of God, born of him, mm -hmm. children of God. Um, that's really heavy in this passage. We've got, you know, everyone who believes, the one who believes. We've got our faith. Those seem to be connected somehow. Uh, and then commandments. There, that's mentioned a few times. So I'm highlighting those things. I'm not assuming I know what it means. I'm not jumping ahead. I'm just going, huh, that that seems to be important. I'm going to circle that. I'm going to highlight that right there. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk through kind of the, the observation part. And 
um, I mentioned this before, you have this little booklet, it's called It Is Written, and this is by Wholehearted as well. You can find this on their website. Um, and it's just a thin little booklet, but it's amazing because it will walk you through the process. And this is what I used when I was doing this um, particular inductive Bible study. And it, it gives you the very specific steps. And so um, the first one, like you said, is pray. The second one is observation, but in, in the booklet, it says consider the context. And so you're answering these questions. Who wrote it? When was it written? And what style was it written? Um, and to whom was it written? And why was it written? So as you're as I was reading through this and answering these questions, it was so much fun to study this. And so for this particular passage, for 1 John 5, 1 through 5, um, who wrote it? It was written by John. Um, it's obviously called 1 John, but interestingly, I didn't know this. There are some people who don't, they're not 100% sure which John it was mm -hmm. who wrote this. And so most strongly believe that 1 John was written by the same author as second and third John and the gospel of John. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who are like, I'm not so sure if it was actually him who wrote it. And so I thought that was really interesting, um, but it's most likely written by the same John. Um, this was John the elder um, and the same one, of course, who wrote the gospel of John. Mm -hmm. um, and it was originally written in Greek. And so obviously it's been translated into English so that we can understand it because most of, most of us don't read Greek. <laughs> I know very few people who actually understand and know how to read mm -hmm. Greek. Um, but that was the original language that it was written in. Um, and then when was it written? Um, from my study, it looks like it was written after Jesus' time on earth. So no later than the 90s AD, um, which I thought was was one thing I read said between 85 AD and 95 AD. Um, and then what style was it written? And it uh, it looks like John, well, I mean, John would have been pretty old when he wrote it. And this was written as a letter. So there's poetry, there's uh, all sorts of different ways that the Bible is written. You've got the history books, um, but these were letters that were written by John. And it looks as if this particular book was written to house church communities made up of mostly Jewish followers of Jesus. Um, and so it was so much fun to read through because these are things that I didn't know. I mean, I've read First John many times, but I didn't know all these details about the book of John. Um, and so yeah. at, one of the ways that I was studying through this was I have a study Bible. Um, and for those who are watching on the video, I'll actually show it to you. It's the ESV study Bible and it's, it's thick. Um, this is my ESV study Bible. We'll put a link to this in the show notes, but I love this Bible because it actually has commentary at the beginning of each book. And it talks about these things. And I will tell you, because the study Bible is written by sinful man, um, I don't agree with every bit of the commentary that's in here. And we shouldn't agree with every single thing if we've not studied it on our own. Mm -hmm. But it was so helpful to read those things. And then I went on to a few different websites, um, bibleproject.com. I think that you mm -hmm. actually suggested bibleproject.com as yes. well. And we've talked about that on the podcast. I love bibleproject.com. They yeah. have, you know, I honestly don't know if they've done every single book of the Bible, but every book I've looked for so far, they have a video that explains, it gives an overview of what that book of the Bible is about. And it's so well done. It's so fantastic. So we'll put links to that in the show notes as well, but there are YouTube videos and you can get them off of their website as well, bibleproject.com. Um, but they are amazing to just give a really clear overview of what the book is, who wrote it, why it was written, who it was written to. So basically what bibleproject.com is, they're doing this step. They're considering the context. They're telling you who wrote it, when it was written, why it was written and all of those things. And so it is a great resource. And again, just like the commentators in my study Bible, probably not everything that they say is perfectly true because they're they're human, but it really will give you a very good idea. And I, I, I don't feel like, and maybe you can comment on this, Nami, I don't think there's been anything from bibleproject.com that I felt like, whoa, they're way off and I would never listen to them again or, or watch any of their videos. Um, I feel like they're pretty solid in their interpretation of the word of God. And it's not so much theology as much as it is just like, here's what this book is about. Do you feel the same about them? Yeah, they do a really good job. Um, it's mainly, it's two guys at, mm -hmm. at the Bible Project, Tim Mackey, and then I forget the name of the, the illustrator, the guy who does the designs. And Tim Mackey, he um, is like fluent in Greek and Hebrew. He has like his PhD in Hebrew. And so he, it, I've taken some of his classes and he's really great um, with, with the Bible and just teaching it. Um, I know some people don't agree with him on different different points, you know, here mm -hmm. or there. But for the most part, I've really 
um, appreciated his stuff and I, I'm in more agreement with him, um, in general yeah. about things. Yeah. 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 It, th- those are very, very helpful tools for studying. Um, and, and of course the most important thing is read the Bible, like read yeah. it for yourself, but we need help sometimes. Um, it's why we go to church, right? And hopefully you have a good pastor who exposits the word of God. If you have a church where they just teach topics and they're teaching about, you know, movies and how the Bible applies to, you know, the Adams family movie. I literally <laughs> saw that. Um, oh my. that's probably not a church that's going to really be deep into the study of God's word. Um, so be in a church that is going to help you exposit it. And, and hopefully you have a pastor who, if there's something that you don't understand about the Bible, you can go to them and say, Hey, I don't understand this. Can you help me to understand God's word, um, in this aspect? And, you know, hopefully they'll be able to do that. So, all right, we're going to talk more about this, but we've got to take a break. We'll be right back. We want to thank all of our sponsors for making this show possible. BJU Press Homeschool, CTC Math, Apologia, and IEW. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Visit the show notes for links to these great companies and thank them for supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. We are back with Naomi. Um, Step three. So I know we're going, we're flying through this and you guys, I, I highly recommend getting this little booklet. It is written is what it's called. Um, And we'll link this in the show notes because this is so helpful. I have used this for the last few weeks as I have gone through this inductive um, process and understand this is not like a one, you're not going to do this in one day. I mean, you could do it in one day, but this, it takes hours even to go through a, a short passage, like what we're going through. So I've just done little bits at a time each day, like just spent a few minutes on each section of this um, as I've studied and watched videos and read commentaries and things like that. Um, So this is not like a, you've got to sit down for the next five hours and do an inductive Bible study. But if you have a passage of scripture that you just think, you know, I really want to dig more into what this is about and understand it better, that's where you want to plug in the inductive Bible study you're probably not going to plug it into every part of the Bible. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at, um, you know, Lamentations, I don't know, maybe there's lots of stuff in Lamentations that you could do, but um, Leviticus, maybe not so exciting to do an inductive Bible study. So it just depends where you're at. You'd be surprised. (laughs) It's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. I I mean, the word of God is powerful and complete and every bit of it is there for a purpose and a reason. So I don't mean that like, oh no, don't do it in this part. But I'm just saying, (laughs) if you get to a part of God's word and you think, I want to know and understand this better, that's where you want to park for maybe a few days and do this inductive Bible study. And And you can do this with your kids as well. So let's talk through step three. Uh, It's consider the meta narrative. Explain what that is. Yeah. So we include this in the inductive guide and it really falls into the context piece. So during our observation of the text, it's so important for us to piece together context because if we aren't considering the original author, the historical background, what the author's intention was or who the audience is um, or the genre of that book, right? We are going to miss some really big pieces to the puzzle. And the meta narrative basically refers to the bigger picture story of scripture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you go through scripture, you're, you're traveling along a journey and you're starting at creation and then you move on into the fall time period. And then there's the redemptive Part, the redemption portion with Christ and his um, dying on the cross for us. And then you have uh, looking ahead to the restoration. And that's where a lot of these epistles fall. It's after Christ has ascended. And so you've got, you've got this timeline to keep in mind. And that is really helpful when you're trying to interpret properly. Yeah. Um, you want to observe these things. You want to be really careful to get the detailed look and the bird's eye view. And that is what the meta narrative is all about. Yeah. So good. You sounded just like the Bible project when you just said that. <laughs> <'Cause that's> like, <laughs> and that's oh, what, what the book honor. of First John is so all flattering. about. <laughs> You've listened to a lot of their videos. I or have. Watched a I lot really of their love videos. them. <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> that you did that. Um, mm. We have just a couple of minutes left. Um, yeah. If you could give us some examples, because this is something that, again, I think is really important for us to learn how to do. And then for us to be able to pass on to our kids how, give us some examples of some exercises for the inductive process that we can practice um, and pass on. And, and maybe um, if you're, you, I know you've got little ones, um, but if you can even talk through maybe some older kids, like older elementary kids, because this is, kids can do this at, you know, ages when they're starting to write and really read, 
but they, you're going to want them to be a little bit older <laughs> in order to do this. So, so yeah. how can we incorporate this into our homeschooling and study of God's word with our kids as well? Yeah, totally. So first, just to kind of put a button on that, um, just so that you guys know what the full picture of an, an inductive study, you know, there's the observation, the context, meta narrative, all that stuff. And then you're going to move into interpretation. And this is also really important. Um, you're going to try and understand the meaning behind the words that you're reading. You're going to try to understand um, what the different interpretations are out there. And I know that you mentioned your study Bible, right? That's, that's one take. The ESV study Bible is one take on right. scripture. There's all kinds of other takes. There's all kinds of other interpretations. And during this part of the process, you're just trying to discern the author's intended message and interpret properly. Uh, and then the last step, which is hugely important, is application. You really want to approach scripture, not just to learn more, but to be transformed. And mm -hmm. so how does this passage apply to my life? How does it change my beliefs? Um, how does it change me? How do I walk away more like Christ from this passage? So that's what inductive st uh, study is. That's kind of the full picture. And when, when it comes to helping our kids do this, yeah, this is a little more in depth. Probably when your kids are older, it will be a little easier to help them get started here. Um, but the, the good news is you can start yourself when your kids are young. And the, the more you've done it yourself, the easier it will be to teach your children. Um, and really, you, you're you just trying to teach your children how to interact with God's word. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just be speaking it to them all the time, even though that's important. You, it, you don't want to just be like, you know, throwing it at them. You want them to come and learn how to ask questions themselves, how to go and research themselves, how to treat the Bible like the exciting adventure that it is to go and learn truth and, and have it change their lives. And so you're just trying to make them comfortable with that. And that's where inductive um, study can be really helpful. So yeah, bring it into your school curriculum, print out passages for them to work on. Um, there's a lot of resources out there uh, that are like pre prepared for this. So Tiny Theologians is one resource I recommend. Oh, They've got okay. some really good stuff for kids when it comes to studying the Bible. It's Tiny Theologians. Um, and then just uh, practice. Just keep keep doing it. Keep going through the steps. You know, observation. What do you see here, kids? You know, what are some words that you're noticing? What's popping out to you? And then just move on and like, okay, like, what should we look up online to find out about the context? Just, you know, sit down at the computer together and start researching First John or the Apostle John and like just start looking through all of those things. And um, the more you do it, the easier it will get and your kids will learn to really love it. And they'll see the Bible as something that can really interact with and study for themselves. Yeah. Oh, such good information. I love this so much. Um, you know, this is a great way to train up our kids in righteousness. Don't just hand them the booklet. Don't just say, here, here's a new booklet for you to do to add to your curriculum. Go do an inductive Bible study. Don't just hand them the Bible or, you know, a quiet time companion and say, go on, go do an inductive Bible study or go do your quiet time. Mm -hmm. Sit with them and train them up in how to do this. This is such an important thing. I'm actually doing this with um, one of my daughters right now. And so I printed up for her um, cause she was having a heart, like she doesn't want to have something separate. She wants to have like almost blanks to fill in. And so I just printed on you know a piece of paper um, some of the questions that I wanted her to answer. And I made a little booklet for That's her. Great. And that makes it so much easier for her to be able to answer the questions um, yeah. kind mm -hmm. of workbook style. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it for her, she processes it much more easily that way. So um, thank you so much for that. We will put all things wholehearted in the show notes, all the links, um, everything that you need. Um, Naomi, thank you so much for your time this week. Thank you for the effort, the love, the passion that you have thrown into this and for your team as well. You have a big team. How many How many are on the wholehearted team? Well, we've got about six people who work um, as contractors with me. And then we okay. have a whole bunch of, of writing volunteers who help yeah. us write our content, just women who are passionate about this topic and they've, they're just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You have a great team. And uh, I know when you, you have a newsletter to sign up for, 
and I get your emails every Monday. And I know you've got others that come out throughout the week, but I know every Monday you've got an email that comes out and it's just an encouraging email on um, how to do a quiet time and, and you know, questions that people are asking about it. And, and it's just constant encouragement. And so you kind of feel like you're part of the wholehearted community. Um, thank you so much, Naomi, for, for being with us and for uh, just what you're doing. You're making a difference and I'm grateful for you and your ministry. Um, check them out at wholehearted. What is it? Wholeheartedquiettime.com? Yep, that's it. Okay, wholeheartedquiettime.com. We'll put those links in the show notes. And thank you guys again for listening. Make sure you stay tuned to the very end for a clip of what's coming up next week on the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. Remember, you can find all things at our website, schoolhouserocked.com. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your day and we will see you back here next time. Bye. A mom said to me one time, aren't you worried about sheltering your children? And I said to her, we care more about sheltering tomato plants in the culture right now than we do about our precious children. And so if someone wants to accuse me of sheltering my children, my answer is always absolutely yes. I will shelter my child until I know my child can stand up against the elements of the culture so that they can grow to maturity. And we slowly begin to remove the shelter from around them as we see that they are mature and that they understand the battle lines around them and can engage the culture from a position of strength rather than weakness. The brain has a hard time differentiating between that which is familiar and that which is true. And this is widely studied, that the more someone hears something, the truer it starts to sound to the point of where it's like, well, of course, everybody knows that. And so I think right now we're getting stuff like that, the idea that, you know, gender identity and, and biological sex are different. That's mm -hmm. That hasn't been studied. No one's like come up with some scientific study or put something in a test tube that proved, oh yeah, you're right, these two things are different. Um, but yet, if you look in the scientific literature, it's never cited. It's mm -hmm. always stated, but it's never cited like, oh, this is the study that we got this information from. They have just yeah. accepted it carte blanche. Like, yep, this is true.